Um, okay, so just quick reminder, your paper proposal is due tonight. Uh, I've already got them from a couple of you, but uh, just make sure that you get that to me by midnight. I will have them graded and commented on probably sometime tomorrow afternoon. Um, so <clears throat> I do also want to remind everybody that you get extra credit on the paper if you go to the writing center. So uh, do that, I guess. <laughs> And, yeah, go ahead, Anna. I'm sorry. How do we, do we like have them just like write a paper that we win or something like that? No? Yeah, yeah they'll, they'll, they'll send me an email. Okay. And they'll say, you know, Hannah came to talk about blah, and this is what we did. And uh, yeah, and th that, that'll be sufficient to get the, to get the credit. Yeah. I think they, they generally default to sending me uh, a notification unless you tell them not to, but why would you tell them not to? Right. right. So, um, and the only other thing we're doing for Thursday is finishing uh, The Dead. Or if we're finishing Devil we're going to be reading The Dead. Um, and then on Tuesday, we have our midterm exam, right? So because I might not be here, right, you know, don't freak out if you get here and Dr. Cowles is here instead. Um, you know, she can pass out and proctor the exam just as easily as I can, you know, like sit here and get a book while you take a test. So. Um, does anybody have any questions about the paper or the exam? With the paper, you won't want us to like support it with like referencing other things that we've read, but we don't need to like quote anything or use any other like secondary sources. Yeah, I don't want you using these secondary sources uh, for this paper. That'll come with the, the research paper at the at the end of the semester. Um, yeah, you can, um, you can make reference to like patterns that we've seen in modern literature generally that you, know, you might want to refer back to another thing that we've read. Uh, but yeah, make sure that that's not really the focus of the paper. So just, you keep your main focus on a single text. So if I'm talking about like a certain character type or representation, I'd say this is also seen in da-da-da. Yeah, da, yeah, you, you can, yeah, you can absolutely use, like, use that as a point of evidence, yeah. Okay. I just want to make sure. Mm -hmm. Um, any other questions about the exam or about the paper? Okay, so I've given you a vocab sheet. Uh, so this kind of boils down which specific vocab terms I want to make sure you know for the exam. Um, so, yeah, th th this. Uh, I guess it's pretty straightforward, right? <laughs> this is, you know, but use this as a study aid. Um, now, I figure uh, maybe we just go over then um, the terms from the like from the last quiz that are actually on the study sheet here today, so we're not kind of belaboring that. We can kind of jump right back into to Joyce. Okay, so. Uh, <clears throat> Do we all recall what a Magdalen home was? It's a home for reform, prostitutes, and fallen women. Mm hmm Okay. Anything else we remember about what a Magdalen home was? Um, uh, most, the, most of the women who ended up having children out of wedlock would um, have to give up their children to an orphanage if they were sent to a Magdalen home. Mm -hmm. Yep, and they often had their names changed and their heads shaved. Um, and what story from Dubliners is this connected to? Clay. Clay, Clay right? Because Maria works as a sub matron in a Magdalene home, right? And the okay. one she worked at was a real one that actually existed. <laughs> yes, Dublin by Lamplight was a real place. Um, okay, uh, Little Chandler. Who or what is Little Chandler? Small, fair-haired guy who was a um, a copyist for mm -hmm. the for the police. It was well, it was a lawyer for yeah, the he, he works in a law office. Okay. Yeah, yeah. He's a, he's a law copyist. Yeah. So he doesn't actually work for the police. He works for a lawyer. Um, but what else uh, do we remember about? What else is important about Little Chandler? What does he dream of being? He wants a to poet. be a poet. Yes, he wants to be a poet. Right but has never written a line of poetry. 
And, and so, he can't leave because he has a wife and children. Yeah, he can't even sit and read a poem in peace, right? Without the baby crying. So he, he at least seems to blame his family responsibilities for his inability to become a famous writer like his friend Ignatius Gallagher. Okay, uh, Lenahan. Who was Lenahan? He's, he's sorry. Uh, he's a derby predictor, or um, mm -hmm. whatever the actual term is. That's yeah. Used. Um, he lives vicariously through the friend groups he creates, uh -huh. which he creates as friend groups just by giving people um, good bets in the derby. And uh -huh. most of them owe him money for doing that. Yeah. Um, he's a racing tipster. Yes, he's a racing tipster. Yeah, he is also a, a kind of a sponge, right? He will stand around at the edge of a crowd and wait until somebody buys around and then uh, get himself included, right? Um, and yeah, he uh, by giving tips on he lives by giving tips on horses and also by um, you know telling stories and amusing animals. So he's this kind of, also kind of debased bard figure. I don't think we really got too much into that. Um, and lastly, a castle Catholic. What was a castle Catholic? That is going to be relevant today as well. It's um, a Catholic who works closely with the police, like the police informant or something like mm -hmm. that. It's a derivable return. Yeah, and not just with the police, but with... The, yeah, with, with, with kind of the, the political authorities generally, right? So they're called Castle Catholics because Dublin Castle was the seat of uh, British political administration in Ireland. So yes, okay, good, all right. Um, so let's jump back into Dubliners then. So what, uh, what do you guys want to talk about today? Okay. It was a prime example of what I come to call a helicopter parent. Okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah, um, so we see that like this phenomenon which we think of as really modern is not actually new, right? No. So let, let's, yeah, let's try to uh, pull that observation out a little bit, right? So what makes Mrs. Carney, do you think, a helicopter parent? She has to be in control of everything to do with her daughter and the performance that she's going to give that she's gonna make. Uh-huh. It all has to run through her first. She's really worried about the money. What's that? She's really worried about the money. Yeah, she's really, really worried about these eight guineas, right? Mm -hmm. And to give you uh, some sense of just how much money we're talking about, um, eight guineas in around uh, 1900, would have been the equivalent of about $2,000. So Kathleen is scheduled for four performances. That's essentially 500 bucks a performance, right? So this is a not inconsiderable sum of money. Now, why do you think she doesn't get it. What happens? They cancel one of the shows and there's not a huge turnout. Okay, yeah, they lousy turnout on the first two nights, right? Also, her mom's kind of a jackass about it. Okay, but do, do, do you think that's the main cause or do you think that's mainly an, that's more or less an excuse. It's an excuse, but I mean, mm -hmm. it has, I think it has a little bit to do with it because she's like following these men around, uh -huh. pestering them, searching for them. Mm -hmm. Like everyone's complaining about her. Yeah. So I think it has a tiny bit to do with it. Sure, but they, they do have a contract, right? Yeah, I think regardless if she was nice or not, they still, she still wasn't gonna get paid. Uh-huh, and why isn't she gonna get paid? She didn't play at one of the shows. Yeah, one of the shows gets canceled, right? Gender bias. There could be some of that in there, right? And we'll kind of tease that out in a minute, right? But I think we we've, see the lousy turnout 
on the first nights. But we're told on one of the nights, right, that there's a good deal of paper in the crowd. Um, if, any of, if any of you looked at the end notes, um, essentially what that means is a lot of comp tickets. So there are a lot of people who are there who didn't pay to be there. So they didn't have a lot of money off of it? Yeah. The real reason they're probably dodging her is that they probably don't have enough to pay her, right? 2,000 bucks for four nights of performances for um, you know an organization of the type that Era Abu seems to be, right? Um, I mean, does it seem like the people who run this organization are wealthy, high-class people? No. Yeah, and <clears throat> there are various kind of hints throughout that Era Abu, which um, was, I don't, I don't, I do not think that Era Abu was a real organization. I think it's um, uh, just kind of parody of different cultural nationalist organizations uh, in Joyce's time. Um, Era Abu means, it means Ireland to victory in Irish Gaelic. And if we look at the things that <clears throat> Mrs. Carney notices about the crowd um, on the first night, look on page 139. We see the concerts were to be on Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. When Mrs. Carney arrived with her daughter at the ancient concert rooms on Wednesday night, she did not like the look of things. A few young men, wearing bright blue badges in their coats, stood idle in the vestibule. None of them wore evening dress. She passed by with her daughter with a quick glance at the open door of the hall showed her the cause of the steward's idleness. At first she wondered she, had she mistaken the hour. No, it was 20 minutes to 8. So what does Mrs. Carney notice here about all the young men standing around waiting for the show to start? Not dressed nicely. Just... Yeah, they're, yeah they're, they're, everybody's in casual dress, right? And when she meets Mr. Fitzpatrick, the secretary of the society, Hollihan is just the assistant secretary, right? He was a little man with a white, vacant face. She noticed that he wore his soft brown hat carelessly on the side of his head and that his accent was flat. He held a program in his hand, and while he was talking to her, he chewed one end of it into a moist pulp. So he's holding the program for the performance, and while he's talking to her, I guess he's got it rolled up and he's just chewing on the end of it, right? Seems like a nervous tick. Okay, yeah, well, although he I think he knows that they uh -huh. don't have the money to pay it, so he's like nervously, like, uh -huh. trying, it's like a nervous tick for him when he's like talking to her. Yeah, well, and, but by this time, this is only the first show, right? So they don't necessarily know yet that they're not going to have the money to pay her. But, um, you know, these kinds of habits, right, are the sorts of things that um, one did not typically associate with class and breeding, right? You know, it's, it's, it's something like, you know, chewing on, you know, chewing on, <laughs> chewing on paper is something that, you know, if you went to a Jesuit school, for example, which would have been a marker of high class in Ireland at this time, uh, the priests would have beaten that out of you by now. So yeah, we've got the secretary of the society chewing paper, and everyone is dressed carelessly, right? Everyone seems to be ca like careless and vacant are words that get thrown around a lot here. No one seems to have much idea what's going on. And who do Fitzpatrick and Hollihan keep referring all complaints back to? Who is, Miss, who is Mrs. Carney going to have to 
um, speak to to get her concerns addressed. Yeah, the committee, right? But do we ever see any signs of the committee? So yeah, so the committee is completely absent here. Now, this is not to say that Mrs. Carney is blameless in all of this either. For one thing, what's given her the idea to get involved with these nationalist organizations in the first place? page 136. Let's look at what Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Carney's own upbringing was like. Can I get somebody to start reading um, the paragraph that starts with Miss Devlin had become Miss Carney? Miss <clears throat> Devlin had become Miss Carney out of spite. She had been educated in a high class convent where she had learned French and music. As she was naturally pale, pale and unbending in manner, she made few friends at school. When she came to the age of marriage, she was sent out to, to many houses where her playing and ivory manners were much admired. She sat amid the chilly circle of her accomplishments, waiting for some suitor to brave it and offer her a brilliant life. But the uh, young men whom she met were ordinary and she gave them no encouragement, trying to console her romantic desires by eating a great deal of Turkish delight in secret. However, when she drew near the limit and her friends began to loosen their tongues about her, she silenced them by marrying Mr. Sir Kearney, who was a bootmaker on Ormond Quay. Okay, so what, what's, her, what's her upbringing like here? Like what, if we look at uh, the account here of Mrs. Kearney's early years before she becomes Mrs. Kearney, what do we notice about this? She was high class. Okay, yeah or at the very least educated in a high-class convent, right? So certainly intended for an upwardly mobile life of some sort. What else? What else do we notice about her? She's turned her daughter into herself. She, like uh -huh. Lenahan was with all his friends, she's living vicariously through her daughter. Okay. So she's putting her daughter through exactly the same upbringing that she went mm -hmm. through, hoping to have like a do-over. Yeah. Situation. Well, because what, what, what's what's the point of this kind of upbringing? Like, why have your daughter um, educated in a high-class convent and taught music and French? To create an angel in a house to make a desirable wife. Exactly, yes. So all of this education, right, she's not being educated to work or, you know, to think for herself particularly, right? She's being educated to make her more marriageable. You know, when they talk about her drawing near the limit, for example, what's the limit they're talking about? Yeah, she's starting to get a little bit too old to find a husband, is what they're saying, right? You have to be so young and so pretty, because mm -hmm. while the men were older at the time, they wanted nice, young women as brides. Well, the, the, the men she's initially meeting are young men, right? She's initially meeting men her own age. Um, and I think... One thing this is speaking to is a particular turn of the century Irish anxiety. So much as we know Dublin was the syphilis capital of Europe, it was also a place where people tended to marry really late compared, compared to other European countries at the time, right? So around 1900, the average age of marriage for a man was about 35. The average age of marriage for a woman was about 31.
So you had a lot of people, and you know, there were a number of, you know, a lot of people who simply didn't marry at all, right? There was a fairly large incidence of, you know, quote unquote, spinsterdom among women. You know, a lot, a lot of, there were a lot of Marias walking around. Um, you know, there were also um, a good number of Lenahans and Corleys walking around. You know, um, men who were getting older but still unattached. So, <clears throat> marriage is a real kind of uh, center of anxiety in this particular period um, in Irish history. Um, yeah, go ahead. When it says, um, trying to console her romantic desires by eating a great deal of Turkish delight in uh -huh. secret, does yeah. that mean she was getting like that? Yeah, she, she, so yeah she, she's, she's eating her feelings, basically. Yeah, she, 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 she's, um, she, she, does, she doesn't like the young man she's meeting. She's upset, so she's stuffing her face full of candy when nobody's looking. Stressy. Yeah. Although I think that the Turkish delight is also kind of meant to kind of harken us back to Araby as well. And um, the young boy's desire for Mangan's sister, um, which kind of remains unfulfilled. Like it's this kind of unfulfilled longing. So I'm glad you drew our attention to that for actually for two reasons then. But let's stick with this paragraph a little longer here. Like what else do we notice about like what does she seem to expect out of life? Romance. Yeah, she expects. I think you know romance, kind of like almost in the capital R sense. You know, like this kind of like imaginative fantasy life, right? And then, how does this all resolve itself for her? Where does she end up? Marrying somebody to keep 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 people quiet. Yeah, she marries out of she marries a bootmaker out of spite. And then a spiteful woman. Uh-huh. Well, you know, I mean again, like like look at this paragraph. I mean like does she have reasons to be spiteful? Yeah. I mean, you know, you know, she she's, you know, here, you know, probably um, you know, something like fifty years old. Uh, life has not turned out the way she expected it to. Um, and she also feels like she's genuinely getting gypped um, out of a fairly large sum of money. So she has some pretty good reasons to be spiteful, right? So she, she undertakes this education in order to guarantee her marriageability. But then none of the young men that she meets seem to be worth these accomplishments that she has, right? You know, I think like... <clears throat> It talks about her ivory manners and the chilly circle of her accomplishments. Right, this is what her educate her high class convent education has got her. Now, how would you interpret these phrases, ivory manners, and the chilly circle of her accomplishments? Ivory manners as in they're perfect, they're mm -hmm. pristine, chilly circle of accomplishments, like uh -huh. she learned them to attain a goal, maybe to, um, to be whatever. Uh, uh -huh. to, for a certain class of people. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead, Bree. Is she, as a person, cold towards people who she views aren't worthy of her accomplishments? I mean, she certainly does seem to be, right? Like, one thing that does come out through all of this, like, not in her favor is that she is a snob, right? And she's constantly noticing things about other people's poor manners. And other people's low class or vulgar accents. But I think.
think, yeah, when we think of it like ivory, right, we think of something, you know, yeah, perfectly white and cold, right? And yeah, the chilly circle of her accomplishments, yeah, these accomplishments, these things that she's learned, don't help her connect with other people, right? They just kind of keep her, you know, they, they keep her unapproachable and unattainable. And just like the young men that she was meeting when she was going to people's houses and trying to find a husband, all the men that she deals with in the era of Abu society are decidedly commonplace, right? Now, <clears throat> why might this matter given the nature of what this society is supposed to be? So era Abu, right? What kind of group do we think this is? The opposite of a West Britain. Yeah, okay, yeah. Clearly, the, yeah, the opposite of West Britons, right? The name is in the Irish language, and they're giving concerts, right? Where um, it seems like even the English soprano is singing an Irish song, right? So then what, what kind of organization is, like what other kinds of organization that we talked about would they be similar to really? Or maybe a parody of, uh, like the Gaelic football league or the yeah, like the Gaelic athletic association and the Gaelic league. Yeah, all of these different cultural nationalist clubs, right? Era Abu was a kind of parody of all of them. Right, these are people who talk to each other in Irish. Um, <clears throat> they, uh, you know, they seem to you know support Irish arts. Irish culture, um, but none of it lives up to Mrs. Carney's vision of what this should be, right? So they're cultural nationalists, but it makes cultural nationalism look like a very kind of tawdry and haphazard thing, right? So, for example, one of the guys who's hanging around um, the concert on the last night, uh, did, you, did any of you pick up anything about this guy, O'Madden Burke? If we look on page 145, um, can I get somebody to start reading the paragraph that says, the two men went along some torturous passages. The two men went along some torturous okay. passages, and up a dark staircase, and came to a secluded room where one of the stewards was uncorking bottles for a few gentlemen. One of the, those gentlemen was Mr. O'Maddenberg, who had found out the room by instinct. He was a suave elderly man who balanced his imposing body when at rest upon a large silk umbrella. His Magniloquent Western name was the moral umbrella upon which he balanced the fine problem of his finances. He was widely respected. Okay, so first off, right, Mr. O'Madden Burke has found out the bar by instinct, right? What does that tell us about him? He's right. not the Hulk. Yeah, or at the very least, you know, maybe may, may somebody who sponges drinks off of people, right? And I think you know we, we can kind of come to that later conclusion by looking at the further description of him, right? Um, so, O'Madden Burke is a very Irishy Irish kind of name, right? And you know we're told that you know he, his magniloquent Western name is the oh, how is it phrased? I had it a second ago. The moral, the moral umbrella, yes, upon which he balances the fine problem of his finances, right? So what does that tell us about how this guy makes his living? First off, the whole thing about a Western name. So a Western name would be important because two cultural nationalists in the late 19th and early 20th centuries 
the rural west of Ireland was regarded as the quote unquote real Ireland. While the urbanized east, you know, say Dublin and Belfast, um, was considered a kind of um, hotbed of West Britainism, right? If you were a through and through Dubliner or a through and through Belfaster, um, you couldn't quite be a real Irish person, right? But O'Madden Burke, with his Western name, right, seems to embody the real thing somehow and is widely respected solely on this count. whether he does anything or not. So this whole thing about living on his name, right? There is actually a kind of irony to this in the story as well. And it has to do with Kathleen Carney's upbringing. If we look on page 137, can I get somebody to start reading the paragraph that starts with when the Irish revival began to be appreciable? to their friends, and these friends sent back other Irish picture postcards. On special Sundays, when Mr. Carney went with his family to the Pro Cathedral, a little crowd of people would assemble after Mass at the corner of Cathedral Street. They were all friends of the Carneys, musical friends or nationalist friends, and when they had played every little encounter of gossip, they shook hands with one another all together laughing at the crossing of so many hands and said goodbye to one another in Irish. Okay, we can kind of pause here, right? Um, so we can see that at least Mrs. Carney and her daughter seem to be involved in these cultural nationalist circles here, right? But what's the whole thing about Kathleen's name? Why would Mrs. Carney be determined to take advantage of her daughter's name when the Irish revival starts coming in. And this, it might help if we think back to the Yeats poems from a couple Isn't of weeks it, ago. Um, the, the protector of Ireland. Yep. Taking advantage of the association with Kathleen Nahoulihan. This um, <clears throat> female embodiment of independent Ireland, right? So, what Mrs. Carney is doing with her daughter, right, is ultimately not that different from what Mr. Romadden Burke does. They're both trading on um, a name that gives them unearned respect and unearned cachet in nationalist circles. Now, when the society decides at the end of the story not to give Mrs. Carney the money, who endorses the decision? at the very end. Who's given the last word? Um, O'Madden Burke leaning his umbrella. Yeah, O'Madden Burke leaning on his umbrella, right? Which is already, like his name has also been compared to an umbrella. Um, gives his final approval, right? So how do you think this is supposed to make us feel about what's just happened to Mrs. Carney? Why do we think that this last word of final approval is put into the mouth of O'Madden Burke? Because he's seen as the uh, 
the Irish person. He is the most Irish of them all. Uh huh. <laughs> so his values trump others just based on his name. Yeah. But within the story, that's then kind of heavily ironized, right? Because we can see his behavior within the story as well, right? That he's really he's somebody who uses his name to catch money and drinks out of people, right? And he's dressed like he's Gary. Yeah. They're the same. Uh-huh. Except in one important way. He's a man and she's a woman. Yep. The man doing it gets away with it and even kind of like manages to lend his moral seal to it, right? But Mrs. Carney doing the same thing. Well, I think there is another way in which these two are different as well, right? And I think that, uh, yeah, I think that the, the man-woman thing is part of it, right? A big part of it. But there's also the class divide thing, right? O'Madden Burke is a Westerner. And thus probably from a rural background. And one thing that we see running through a couple of these stories in terms of kind of class antagonism is this divide between town and country that we just talked about a minute ago. So the terms that were often used in Irish discourse were Jackeen for a city person. Right? Jackeen uh, meaning little Jack, right? You know, so somebody who is um, puffed up with his own importance. Um, and the term for a country person was culchy. I, I, have, I, don't, I don't know the origin of the term culture. And so Madden Burke isn't just a man, he's also a Westerner. Whereas Miss Carney, Mrs. Carney, formerly Miss Devlin, um, seems to come from more of like what we might call like a yuppie background, right? So her attachment to Irish nationalist tropes might always kind of come off as a little inauthentic, right? At least within certain crowds. And indeed, like her promotion of the Irish language movement is really about trying to show her daughter to the best possible advantage, right? And get Kathleen out in society and get her husband. So on the whole, how does this story make these cultural nationalist groups look? Unorganized. Okay, disorganized. Yeah, the era of Abu clearly doesn't have its shit together, right? It seems more like an idea than an actual group. Because uh -huh. the committee is so absent. Mm -hmm. It's more like it's just an idea. Or like a, what am I, what's the word I'm looking for? Someone help me. Not, yeah, that's, all, that's the only word I can think of. It's like an idea, uh -huh. it's not really tangible. Okay, yeah. And it, yeah, we have, we have no idea whether the committee actually exists, right? Or if it's just a way that the various members of this group pass the buck. It's like, oh, well, the committee will have to decide. Mrs. Carney even thinks of saying, who is the committee, pray, you know, uh, but thinks better of it and doesn't press them on it. But yeah, like, yeah, they, they, no one knows who's on the committee. They're completely invisible. So whatever authority structure is in place with this group, we never see it, and they seem completely disengaged, right? What else? Do, what other conclusions do we come to about these cultural nationalist movements based on this story? How else are they depicted? Apart from the fact that, okay, so they're apparently, 
run by an absentee committee, right? There's no one in charge. So what, for example, so what that they value O'Madden Burke's name so much? Or that they would value Kathleen Carney for her name? What does that tell us about them? They want true Irish. Okay, then yeah, they're, 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 they're looking for some kind of quote unquote true Irishness, right? But where are they finding that true Irishness? Are they finding it in anything deeper meaningful? No. Yeah, it's, it's a kind of superficial idea of Irishness that's based only on a name. Right? It's kind of like if we look at um, the next story in the collection, Grace, right, the character of Martin Cunningham. Why do all of Martin Cunningham's friends respect him? It's not his name, but it's a, uh, something that is kind of just as superficial. If we look on page 157, Can I get somebody to read the two paragraphs and start with Mr. Cunningham was the very man for such a case? Mr. Cunningham was the very man for such a case. He was an elder colleague of Mr. Power. His own domestic life was not very happy. People had great sympathy for, with him, for it was known that he had married an unpresentable woman who was an, an incurable drunkard. He had set up house for her six times, and each time she had pawned the furniture on him. Everyone had respect for poor Martin Cunningham. He was a thoroughly sensible man, influential and intelligent. His blade of human knowledge, natural astuteness, mm -hmm. particularized by long association with cases in the police courts, had been tempered by brief immersions in the waters of general philosophy. He was well informed. His friends bowed to his opinions and considered that his face was like Shakespeare's. So why do they respect Martin Cunningham? He seems smart. He seems smart, right? How do we know he's not? For one thing, he married a woman who pawns all his furniture whenever they spent the house. Yes, he's had to set up house for his wife six times, and each time she has pawned the furniture for drink, right? So he can't be that clever or that good a judge of character, right? So what is the real thing that makes people respect him? His ability to talk. Maybe look at the end of the second paragraph here. Because he's well informed. His looks. Yeah, because he looks like Shakespeare, right? Mm -hmm. His friends respect him because he looks like Shakespeare. Which is just as stupid a reason to respect someone as that they have you know, a particularly um, nationalist sounding name, right? So respect and authority um, in all three of these stories are, kind of are located in the wrong kinds of places. Right? What we see in like examples of an all three is kind of like these kind of skewed sense of values, even a kind of distortion of values um, in various ways. So for example, in Grace, the priest that they're all going to hear is a guy by the name of Father Purvin. Now, this is a fairly obscure little joke, like most of Joyce's jokes. But remember I told you about that red light district in Dublin, Monto? Purden Street is a street in that red light district. So Father Purden is named for a street that is full of brothels. Why well, does he like priests that likely have <laughs> yeah, we, or at the very least, we see a lot of really sketchy priests wandering in and out of these stories, right? Did he have something against them? 
Uh, short answer, yes. Um, like many young, um, upwardly mobile men in Ireland at his time, Joyce was educated in Jesuit schools. Um, and there's a kind of lingering respect he has for the Jesuit order. Um, but I think he's also bothered by the amount of control and authority that uh, the church has in Irish life on the whole, right? And in particular, he seems, I think, bothered by um, the church's association with um, the existing power structures, right? So to give you an example of part of why this might be, just short kind of history lesson. So we all remember about uh, Parnell from last time, right? Charles Stuart Parnell and the Irish Parliamentary Party. Okay, so when Parnell had his little scandal in 1890, the Irish Parliamentary Party split into two factions, largely on moral grounds. The smaller faction stuck with Parnell as their leader and were more concerned about kind of like his effectiveness in the cause um, than they were about um, his uh, the details of his personal life, right? The anti-Parnellite faction, which was the larger faction, decided that he had been um, that he had been, he'd lived a dissolute life and was thus ethically and morally unfit to continue to lead the party. And so they dropped and abandoned him. Joyce's family were Parnellites. His father in particular um, was <clears throat> a strong supporter of Charles Stuart Parnell. Now, which side of this divide do you think the um, the hierarchy of the Catholic Church came down on? No, what side were they on? Yeah, which side would you would you suspect the hierarchy of the Catholic Church in Ireland were on? The Parnell side. The anti. -Parnell. Yeah, they were anti Parnellites. In fact, like several um, high ranking priests and bishops would you know denounce Parnell from their pulpits, right? So. <clears throat> I think Joyce comes to view the church as holding back Ireland's best chance for any kind of um, resolution of its political situation. I think he's also bothered by the, the kind of unquestioning obedience that priests seem to command, especially from a lot of uh, middle-class, well-connected Catholics, right? So like, for example, in Ivy Day in the committee room when this guy, Father Kean shows up, how does Mr. Henchy treat him? Look on page 126. Isn't he like an unattached? Yeah, we find out later after Father Kean is left that he seems to be a, a disgraced priest they of call some sort. Black right? sheep. They treat him yeah. Kind of coldly. Yeah. Well, not when he's there though, right? When he's there, Mr. Henchy is almost obsequious in his attention to it, right? You know. Can we get you anything, Father? Have a seat, Father. Have a drink, Father. Right? Can I show you down the stairs, Father? And then once he's gone, that's when they start talking about him, right? But <clears throat> as long as he's present, everybody sort of you know bows down to him and kisses his feet, right? It's like in high school, we have that one coach that's a teacher that everyone hates. 
<laughs> while you're in class, you're really nice about it, and as uh -huh. soon as they walk out of the room, everyone starts like complaining and calling them very not nice names. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I imagine that Father Keenan is probably sketchier than, than most teachers. Um, but yeah, like, like, I think like, the way he's, dis like, if we look on page 125, the way he's described here, right? Um, a person resembling a poor clergyman or a poor actor appeared in the doorway. But his black clothes were tightly buttoned on his short body. And it was impossible to say whether he wore a clergyman's collar or a layman's because the collar of his shabby frock coat the uncovered buttons of which reflected the candlelight was turned up about his neck. He wore a round hat of hard black felt. His face, shining with raindrops, had the appearance of damp yellow cheese, save where two rosy spots indicated the cheekbones. Ugh, right? He seems very distasteful. <laughs> yeah. To say it nicely. Uh-huh. Yeah, he's, he's shabby looking. Um, he looks like rotten. his complexion is the color of rotten food. Right? No one likes it. But yeah, I think that the the really important thing in the description though is right at the, is near the beginning, right? Where he's a poor clergyman or a poor actor. And it's impossible to say whether he wears a clergyman's collar or a layman's, right? So his status is kind of his appearance renders his status ambiguous. Mr. Henshee and Mr. O'Connor aren't really entirely sure what he is, right? On the next page, right, tell me, John, said Mr. O'Connor, lighting a cigarette with another pasteboard card. Hmm? What is he exactly? Ask me an easier one, said Mr. Henshee. Right? Don't ask me to explain this guy. The one thing he does know is that he seems to be tight, Father Kean seems to be tight with um, one of these wealthy people who's supporting their political candidate, right? He has connections, and that's why they tolerate him. Exactly. He, he ha yeah, he has connections. Isn't that kind of like, who was it, Corley, who had connections, and that's why he was safe? Yeah, because everyone that's, why, that's why he's not in jail, yes. yeah. Uh-huh. Because, yeah, he's, his father's an inspector, an inspector of police, and he is himself suspected of being a police informant. So the theme of social connections being important? Yeah, but all, so I think, yeah, that social connections are also important, right? But let's think about what else these different social connections have in common. They often do with politics. Yeah, they're political. And do they seem to be above board? Or are they like kind of maybe inching towards corruption. I think one thing that we get from all three of these stories, and even you know, maybe some of those that they're connected with, right, is this kind of overarching sense of a city that is run by little cliques that all scratch, that scratch each other's backs, right? So one thing that leads to the overall sense of paralysis is this kind of larger notion of corruption. In business, in politics, in the church, and even in these little cultural nationalist societies. So, if we look, for example, at the end of Grace, at all of the people who have come to this retreat uh, that Mr. Kieran and his friends are attending on page 172. Right. In one of the benches near the pulpit sat Mr. Cunningham and Mr. Kernan. In the bench behind sat Mr. McCoy alone, 
and the bench behind him sat Mr. Power and Mr. Fogarty. Mr. McCoy had tried unsuccessfully to find a place in the bench with the others, and when the party had settled down in the form of a quint, excuse me, a quincunx, he had tried unsuccessfully to make comic remarks. As these had not been well received, he had desisted. Even he was sensible of the decorous atmosphere, and even he began to respond to the religious stimulus. In a whisper, Mr. Cunningham drew Mr. Kern's attention to Mr. Harford, the moneylender, who sat some distance off, and to Mr. Fanning, the registration agent and mayor maker of the city, who was sitting immediately under the pulpit beside one of the newly elected counselors of the ward, probably Dick Tierney, the same guy whom they're campaigning for in Ivy Day in the committee room, right? Fanning is the guy that Father Keen is supposedly tight with and wants to see. To the right sat old Michael Grimes, the owner of three pawnbroker shops, and Dan Hogan's nephew, who was up for the job in the town clerk's office. Farther in front sat Mr. Hendrick, the chief reporter of the Freeman Jur the Freeman's Journal, and Poro Carroll, an old friend of Mr. Hearn's, who had at one time been a, consider a considerable commercial figure. So, what kinds of men are sitting at this or here are present at this retreat? What do they all have in common? What kinds of men have come out to hear Father Perlin preach? <clears throat> it, mentioned, oh, it mentions that some of them are looking for jobs. Yeah, some of, yeah, some of them are looking for jobs, right? And others have jobs to give, right? Like those kind of like patronage kind of jobs. So what we have here, by and large, are kind of like big men in the political and financial communities, right? Although I think it's also in, uh, interesting to note here that one of them is a money lender and another is a pawnbroker. Given what we know about Mr. K Mr. Kernan and most of his friends from earlier in the story, what what is the state that just about all of Mr. Kernan's friends are in financially? They're all in debt, yeah. They're almost all in debt to somebody, and they've even tried to screw each other over at various points. There's a, uh, you know, I'm not sure if y'all caught this, but on page 160, um, they reveal some information about Mr. Power, or uh, not about Mr. Mr. McCoy, right? Mr. Power did not relish the use of his Christian name. He was not straight-laced, but he could not forget that Mr. McCoy had recently made a crusade in search of valises and portmanteaus to enable Mrs. McCoy to fulfill imaginary engagements in the country. More than he resented the fact that he had been victimized, he resented such low playing of the game. So, <clears throat> we know the, the McCoys are musicians, that Mrs. McCoy still gives music lessons. And why would Mr. McCoy be making up singing engagements for his wife in the country in order to collect uh, valises and portmanteaus from his, like, basically luggage, right, from his friends. Why would he make this story up to try to collect luggage? What is he actually going to do with the luggage? Pawn it. Exactly. So yeah, he has tricked, his, he tricked a bunch of his friends into giving him luggage so he could go and pawn it. So most of these guys are tied to each other by not always entirely honest financial uh, relationships, right? Much as Corley is indebted to Lenahan, but Lenahan has to follow Corley around to make sure he gets paid back. And then if we go to uh, Father Purden's sermon on page 173, did any of you recognize uh, the little bit of scripture that he's uh, <clears throat> that he quotes here. Is anybody familiar with uh, the parable that this comes from? I 
I'll take your silence to mean no. Okay. So this is taken from the book of Luke, chapter, chapter 16. And it's the parable of the dishonest steward. So <clears throat> there's a steward who is, um, he's been mismanaging his master's accounts. And so the master is going to fire him. And so in order to prepare a place for himself somewhere else, he calls in all of his master's debtors and settles their debts for a lot less than they owe, kind of tricking the master out of what he's due. And then the master is pleased with the steward's cleverness and decides to keep him on. Um, so the interpretation that Father Purden makes here is that the world is hard for business people, right? And it's not easy to conduct your business ethically and morally, right? So don't sweat it too much. Take it easy. But what he does here is kind of omit um, the end of the parable, which is usually taken as the actual meaning of it, right? Thou canst not serve both God and mammon. Do you know what mammon means? Does anybody know what mammon means? Okay, so mammon is essentially material wealth. So the basic message that Father Whorehouse is preaching from his pulpit is that you can serve both God and mammon. And that by serving mammon, you are also serving God. So what this story does, like it kind of it ends with tying together these various strands of political and financial corruption that have run through all three of these stories of Dublin's social life. So, what questions, uh, what other questions do you all have about like anything in these three stories? Or, you know, there are, you know other things that you picked up on and you want to talk about? One thing to note in Grace, by the way, is that almost all of the information that Mr. Cunningham gives to the others is wrong. So yeah, virtually all of his historical facts are incorrect. So could you make the argument that his own name is a sign for cunning? Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, you know, I, I, yeah, I, you know, I never really thought about that, but yeah, that's that's absolutely possible, right? But yeah, his. He presents a wise and sensible appearance, but he's really just managed to make use of connections to you know, keep body and soul together, right? I think it's also kind of interesting, they talk a lot about the doctrine of papal infallibility. While getting dozens of facts about church history and philosophy wrong. And if you look if you look on page 168, right, you know, they talk you know, they talk about, you know, well, you know, were there some bad popes? And so, oh well yes. Oh of course there were some bad lots, but the astonishing thing is this. Not one of them not the biggest drunkard, not the most out-and-out -out ruffian, not one of them ever preached ex-cathedra a word of false doctrine. Now, isn't that an astonishing thing? 
Now, of course, why can't the Pope preach a word of false doctrine? Because he's the authority on it. Yeah, because of the doctrine of papal infallibility, right? So, by definition, whatever the Pope says is orthodoxy. So, you know, Mar Martin Cunningham is presenting this as this sort of you know, fascinating fact of you know theology or church history, when in fact it's actually just the result of a rule the church made on its own. It's like impossible for it to be false. Yeah, and which only became a rule in 1870. And I don't know why. <laughs> But yeah, so it's, it's just you know one example of a lot of motivated reasoning in this particular story. And in fact, like the, the whole story, Grace kind of centers on a kind of conspiracy, right? Mr. Kernan's friends have got together to try to make him go to this retreat with them. They're trying to basically trying to trick him into being interested in going on this retreat. So the whole thing is conducted um, slightly dishonestly. We haven't really, um, you know, before we go, like, we haven't really said much about Ivy Day in the committee room. Um, what did you all think of that story? If you had any particular thoughts about it at all. Were there things in it that you found confusing or hard to follow? Okay, I figured that of all of them, you would probably have the most trouble with this one because um, it requires some level of knowledge of turn of the century Irish politics. So where, where did like where did y'all feel lost with this one? understand a lot of the commentary. There's um there's this uh -huh. there's this moment on page one twenty eight where they're talking about the mayor of Dublin okay. sending out for a pound of chops for his dinner. And that's a very extravagant thing to do in the turn of the century Iowa. Yes. And that just makes it follows through with um like superficial rulers that don't yeah. really have that much power, yeah. but they're and, a lord of this land, so therefore yeah. they have to be, or are, decadent. And yeah, and Lord Mayor is pretty much an entirely ceremonial position. Right? The Lord Mayor of Dublin doesn't actually do a whole hell of a lot, and didn't do a whole hell of a lot in 1900 either. They mostly just lead parades. Um, but he gets to live in a nice house, and he gets to order a pound of chops for his dinner um, at public expense, right? Meanwhile, what they've said um, about what it takes to become mayor on the previous page, right, is that essentially if, um, you have to go into debt, right, you have to essentially um, go into debt to the various city fathers in order to get them to make you mayor, right? So here's someone who is in debt to these powerful authorities, the people who really run the city, but is still living as a parasite off of the people, right? So we've got that kind of theme of parasitism in here as well. And we also kind of see that with their, their distrust of Joe Hines, right? This guy who's canvassing for another candidate. Um, you know, Mr. Henchy doesn't want him hanging around because he, he doesn't want him sponging, right? He doesn't want him taking any of the money or any of the drinks that are intended. All right, so we're about out of time, so let me give you the reading questions for the dead. Um, the dead, for those of you who do not know, is, at least as far as I'm concerned, the greatest short story ever written in the English language. So 
So if you don't like it, I will die. Please do.